I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I want to talk about whether we live in multiple worlds. Nelson Goodman published in 1978 a rather fascinating book entitled Ways of World Making. He argues that differing worldviews are in effect different worlds and the world as we know it is not something that is just there waiting to be discovered but is in fact created by our understanding of it. He describes this work as skeptical, analytic and constructionalist. And by multiple worlds, he means actual multiple worlds and not multiple possible worlds, such as in the work of David Lewis. Take for instance the motion of planetary bodies. According to one reference frame, the sun is still, while according to another, the sun is moving. But how is it apart from all frames, we may ask? What is the reality of the motion apart from all reference frames? Does this question even make sense? What we have in our understanding of the world are multiple descriptions and accounts of the world rather than the actual world itself. We are confined to ways of describing whatever is described. Our universe consists of these ways of description rather than of a world or of worlds, writes Goodman. However, this notion of multiple actual worlds seem rather counterintuitive. We think that there only exists one world and hence there can be only one true account of it, either making all other accounts false or if true, reducible to that one account. In this account, we expect our description of things to correspond to actuality. This is known as the correspondence theory of truth, where we expect that right descriptions and theories are describing the world as it actually is. But according to Goodman, we do not have one account of the world, but multiple accounts, some of which even contradict, but are still right. Because we have multiple accounts of the world, we effectively have multiple worlds. Odd and counterintuitive as Goodman's idea may seem, it is already how we in fact understand the world. The sciences have, for the same phenomena, varying theories that are accepted and in use at the same time, such as Einstein's theory of relativity and Newton's mechanics. For the same scenery, different artists and different writers will depict it in different ways. In both the sciences and the arts, some of these descriptions are incommensurable. That is, they do not translate and hence cannot be reduced to each other. Even our sense perceptions of the same situation vary. For instance, we may feel the same temperature to be colder if we are ill. How we feel while having an experience and then what we recall of our feelings later may differ. For instance, in the case of nostalgia, have a romantic view of what could have been rather unpleasant events. The notion that we can begin understanding the world objectively from pure data, from a perception without conception, is false. Goodman does not bother to restate the arguments in philosophy on why such an objective view is not possible since they are well established but I would just mention Immanuel Kant's theory in his Critique of Pure Reason. When we perceive, we perceive through our sense apparatus, already through a lens which separates us from the object perceived. We then interpret or filter these perceptions through our cognitive faculties to understand what we are sensing. We can never know the thing in itself, but only our experience of the thing. And as already mentioned, different people can have different experiences of the same thing. Once we accept that there can be several right versions and that these versions are not reducible to one, a unity can still be found, not in some kind of neutral something beneath these versions but in an overall organization embracing them. According to Goodman, there are many worlds in the sense that many different world versions are of independent interest and importance, without any requirement or presumption of reducibility to a single base. 
Accepting various versions of the world does not mean a relaxation of scientific rigour, since science itself presents differing incommensurable versions. Instead, such acceptance is a recognition that standards different from, yet no less exacting than those applied in science, are appropriate for appraising what is conveyed in perceptual or pictorial or literary versions. How do we come up with these different worlds? How we understand the world, be it through atoms, waves or energy, are concepts we make up. That does not mean that they lack basis. Their basis comes from other worlds in the sense that new concepts arise from concepts already in existence. For instance, the scientific concept of matter was in earlier times a planetary model of electrons spinning around a nucleus. While this still serves as a functioning model that continues to be taught to school children, more sophisticated theories such as quantum mechanics have since been developed and have overtaken the planetary model. Having established that multiple worlds exist, Goodman's aim is to examine how we build those worlds. He proposes five ways of world making. 1. Composition and decomposition. 2. Waiting. 3. Ordering. 4. Deletion and supplementation. 5. Deformation. 1. Composition and decomposition. This way of world making involves taking apart and putting together. Taking apart includes dividing holes into parts, splitting species into subspecies, analyzing complex objects by examining their components and making distinctions between things. Putting together includes composing holes out of parts, grouping members into classes and species, combining components into complexes and drawing connections between things. How we make sense of these processes using language is to apply labels such as words and names to them. To identify things and group them under a name is a matter of how we choose to organize them. To ask if two things are the same, we need to know the same what. For instance, two dogs are similar in the sense that they both belong to the species of dogs, but they can be of different breeds, and even if the same breed, have different temperaments. A cat and a dog may differ in species, but may share the same owners. So to say two things are similar or different is a function of how we decide to group things. Words may differ in that not everything belonging to one belongs to the other, writes Goodman. He gives an example of how Eskimos have many words for snow, while people living in warmer climes may have only one word for it, making the way they understand and even experience the white fluffy stuff differ. Having many words, or only one, makes sense for either group since they have different practical needs. These needs can also be theoretical ones. For example, a physicist may be using Einstein's equations of relativity in their theoretical work, while an engineer does his theoretical work just fine using Newtonian mechanics. Even whether we consider something as a repetition is a matter of organization. Goodman's example is of scientific laboratory experiments which aim to repeat their test conditions, but there are always some differences between them. What is important is to keep the relevant features constant. Another example he gives is of two different performances of the same piece of music. The performances may be very different, with not just different musicians and different audiences, but differences in style and interpretation. How then do we know it is the same piece of music? We recognize them to be the same since they use the same score. Whether we count something as same or different is the world we make. 2. Waiting What is considered relevant and irrelevant makes for different worlds. Difference in emphasis by giving prominence to different features changes how things are viewed. My example is how adults and children watching the sound of music may understand the movie differently. The parents may notice the sexual tension between the Baron and Maria, while the kids may pay attention instead to the adorable tunes and the children in the film. They give different weight to different aspects of the film and hence have different experiences of the same film. 
3. Ordering How we choose to order and organize things changes how we perceive and understand the world. For instance, the way a commuter and a driver visualize the city may differ, with a commuter seeing the separation between two points as the number of stops on the subway, while a driver may be thinking of whether there is a road connecting the points. To the driver, the destination may be near, by road, but to the commuter, it may be completely inaccessible since no bus or train goes there. Most countries organize their work week with work on weekdays and rest on weekends. Though some countries, such as Egypt, have rest days on Friday and Saturday. So while we may have Monday blues, do Egyptians have Sunday blues? These ways of organization are clearly not some kind of natural feature of the world, but are instead built into a world by us. 4. Deletion and Supplementation We tend to overlook what we deem to be not pertinent. When we have only fragments and clues, we are adept at filling in what is not there. For instance, when we see words that are spelled incorrectly, we easily supply the missing letters to read the word correctly. We easily recognize a picture of a circle even if the line forming the circle is not closed. When we have goals, we are often blind to what does not help in our pursuit of the goal. For the scientist, his data points are less than what is suggested by the best fit curve he fits to the data, and yet on the basis of that curve, he constructs elaborate theories. In the cinema, there are 24 frames of still images per second, but we do not see the continuity gaps. Goodman highlights an experiment when two separated spots of light are switched on one after the other. The viewer perceives that there is only one spot which is in motion, even though in reality it is simply two spots of light. If the shapes of the spots are different, the viewer actually sees the first shape smoothly transform to the second, say from a circle to a square. The mind supplements the smooth transition in this case. 5. Deformation Some changes are reshapings or deformations that may, according to point of view, be considered either corrections or distortions, notes Goodman. Scientists fit and smooth curves that would otherwise be a rough one if they simply connected the data points. In the muller liar effect, our vision stretches out lines with arrowheads pointing in and shrinks lines with arrowheads pointing out. Composers make variations of familiar themes with novel results. These deformations create new versions of the world. The five ways Goodman offers are neither exhaustive nor mandatory, and they can happen in combination. Their examples can overlap in the various ways of world making, such as with the scientist's curve fitting, which can be the way of deformation or supplementation. The main point Goodman is making is that truth can be a tricky concept. As simple and intuitive as the correspondence theory of truth may be, correspondence can be hard to find. Truth cannot be defined or tested by agreement with the world, for not only do truths differ for different worlds, but the nature of agreement between a version and a world apart from it is notoriously nebulous, he writes. He has already dealt with both, but just to recap by way of examples, truths differing for different worlds are for instance whether the sun is moving or stationary using different reference frames. Agreement between a version and the world can be the curve fitting done by a scientist when none of the data points may actually fall on his best fit curve. The world of theory and the world of observation seem to be two differing worlds. Goodman subscribes instead to a coherence theory of truth, where a version is taken to be true when it offends no unyielding beliefs and none of its own precepts. That is, it is in line with certain core beliefs and it is self-consistent, meaning that there are no contradictions within the version. Besides, what is accepted as true changes over time. For instance, the geocentric model of the universe has given way to the heliocentric one, which is not even regarded to be the best theory currently. Truth 
Far from being a solemn and severe master, is a docile and obedient servant, according to Goodman. Returning to the example of the scientist whose role we expect to be that of a search for objective truth, his results from observations are little more than suggestions of overall structure and significant generalizations. He seeks system, simplicity, scope, and when satisfied on these scores, he tailors truth to fit. Besides, truth comes in various forms. For scientific texts, it is literal truth that matters, but in other texts, such as poems and novels, metaphorical or allegorical truth may matter more, such that literally false statements may yield truth in other forms. They may, for instance, show rather than say, or deliver their message through examples. Truth may also not be relevant in versions such as pictures or music. Music and abstract art may represent nothing and in that way have no truth value, but they can still express or refer to something. Even theories may not be true, but can still have value in organizing and informing, such as theories on how to organize a society. To speak of truth in such matters may not make sense since while there may be a right and pragmatic way to govern a society, that does not make it a true one. What do we do with these multiple worlds? One attitude can be to take one version as the real world and the others as versions of the same world but differing from the standard version in accountable ways. A scientist may take her world described by her equations as the real one and consider the other versions, such as the perspective of the novelist or artist, as merely poetic license. Likewise, an artist may consider how the way he perceives the world to be real, and the equations of motion or atomic structures of the scientist to be a matter of scientific practice. For the person in the street, the atoms of the scientist or the brilliant splashes of colour of the artist may differ from his familiar serviceable world which he had built from his fragments of knowledge of both the sciences and the arts. He might be aware of the theory of relativity, but it does not affect how he drives his car or washes the dishes, the way he does it being a matter of habit. Goodman writes, Our passion for one world is satisfied at different times and for different purposes in many different ways. This firstly does not mean that all versions are right. When they are, it does not mean that all right versions are suitable for all purposes. We put on different hats depending on the situation. The particle physicist may deal with atoms and subatomic particles in his theoretical work, but when he sits at his desk, he sees a solid wooden surface. When we read, do we see oddly shaped squiggles or do we see words? It depends. Both are right though both may not be equally useful for our purpose of reading. Recognizing the existence of alternative worlds does not mean we should abandon the scientific or artistic enterprise, since merely the awareness of the various ways of seeing the world does not enrich the various versions of the world we straddle. We still need to craft the scientific theories, paint the paintings and compose the music. However, we can recognize that knowing it's not just a matter of determining what is true. It can be about finding a fit, the way pieces fit in a jigsaw puzzle. Knowing is as much remaking as reporting, Goodman writes. Comprehension and creation go on together. Thank you.